we are going to look at a disease that occurs as a result of formation of hydatid cysts. So the condition is called hydatidosis or hydatid disease. So we're going to look at the organism itself, how it's spread, and the transmission cycle, then the manifestation of the clinical picture, how it is diagnosed, and then management followed by prevention and control. So this image is a famous image um, um, that was um, taken during a research that was being conducted into Kana, Kenya. And they were trying to look at um, the prevalence of hydatidosis in um, Turkana, Kenya, um, as a result of the close relationship between the Turkanas and how they live with their dogs. So for those who don't know, Turkanas are herders or pastoralists in nature, and they normally have also dogs uh, with them. So all this combination um, was found to actually have a very big bearing on the transmission of hydatidosis. So the organism itself, so we've seen the condition is hydatidosis or hydatid disease, is caused by a tapeworm called echinococcus granulosus. So this is actually a cystode, which is a tapeworm, and you can see its structure, it's normally flat uh, of some sort, and it, it has um, segmentation, and so that's a cystode. So echinococcus granulosus is also called the dog tapeworm, and you'll see why we actually link it to dogs and so that's that's why it's called the dog uh, the, the dog tapeworm. So this is basically its structure where it has a scolex so where the head is and then the neck. Then you have three major areas here where you have the mature normally eggs, then where they mature, and then these these when when they come now to the gravid proglottid, this is the section which normally peels off, and then um we have the release of the eggs. So in terms of spread. Um, or basically the distribution. Normally this is found where we have uh, herders who are keeping sheep or cattle, and it will be more prevalent, especially in rural areas, more than um, like urban areas, because uh, urban areas rarely will you have uh, huge flocks of cattle or sheep. So these animals where um, these are found, like sheep or cattle, um, they, they, they actually act as the intermediate um, uh, intermediate host for this um, disease or this organism. Uh, worldwide, according to World Health Organization, you can see majority of the areas that have this kind of um, disease is mostly Africa, some part of South America, Asia as well, uh, but very few cases when you go to America and some parts of Europe as well. Okay, as you can see, some part of Northern Africa and also Kenya and East Africa we have a very high prevalence of this condition. So how is it transmitted? So the transmission cycle is very interesting. So first of all, we have to understand that the human host is not supposed to be in this whole cycle. Actually, we are just accidental, okay? Because typically this whole thing happens, the cycle happens uh, between dogs, okay? And the other, um, other animals that actually are intermediate, like sheep or cattle. So the definitive host, uh, is the dog or other canines. And then the intermediate hosts are normally the sheep, the cattle, and even sometimes the camel. So normally the, the humans are not supposed to be in this uh, cycle. And therefore, when they get this, uh, when they get the eggs of this um, organism, the, it, the transmission cycle basically ends up there. So it is a dead end host. That's why we're saying the human host is a dead end host because humans themselves cannot transmit the Cannot, cannot participate in the transmission as well. So once they get it, they will suffer the disease, but that's the end of it. They will not transmit it to another to another human or to another animal, okay? So this is just a, a small indication of what you just talked about, uh, but we'll go through this deeply um, and understand how it happens. So if the definitive host here is, um, is the dog, for example, in this case, um, so what happens is that the dog, which is already infested, with this echinococcus granulosa, so uh, the the adult worm of echinococcus granulosum, now the one that is gravid, like now we, I told you the gravid proglottid, this one is the one that carries now the embryonated eggs, so it passes it down. So this this embryonated egg, <clears throat> okay, is normally passed on as feces of the definitive host. And now as, as cattle or sheep, whatever is around there that is uh, grazing and finds uh, and is grazing on the, on, the, on the grass, 
and eats up, for example, grass that has the feces that has the eggs, then it ends up ingesting the eggs. Okay, so the, the eggs that are ingested, they're normally already impregnated, so they hatch, um, they hatch and they start penetrating the intestinal walls of the, of the new intermediate host. Now, when they get to different organs, they become uh, cysts. And then now this cyst, for example, in the case where, um, so this is cyst lodge into the, the viscera or in different organs of the intermediate host. So in the instance, for example, when the intermediate host like the sheep or the cattle are slaughtered, for example, to be fed on, um, some parts are not eaten or they're just thrown around. So when another dog comes um, and, and eats that meat, which has that cyst, it takes up the it takes up the worm, okay, and then now once it takes up the worm, it goes up to the intestines of the of the dog and then develops up up until it is in the adult stage, okay. So that is the typical cycle. So the human being normally gets into the cycle when accidentally because of their close interaction with the dog, when they accidentally take up the embryonated uh, feces. So the development will occur, uh, will actually occur. The, the eggs will uh, hatch, they will penetrate the intestines of the adult, um, human adult, and then go to different organs, for example, the liver or the lungs. And then there they will develop into a cyst and form um, a cyst, a, sac, a, a cyst there, which now will, be, uh, will bring all the signs and symptoms. So this is what we've just talked about. The eggs are being passed via the feces by the dog, an infected dog, and then these other domesticated animals take them up and then they hatch, the eggs hatch into the intestines and then penetrate the, the intestinal wall into the portal circulation, which now ultimately brings them to different organs like the liver or the lungs, where we have the cyst now. So when the dogs eat, for example, a diseased animal or an animal that has been slaughtered, which had the cyst, then they proceed to develop the worms, the eggs of the worms develop into mature adult worms. So humans basically uh, accidentally ingest the eggs and these eggs now they develop into different levels of different stages of the larvae as they migrate into the intestines and then they they can now go to different organs. So the liver, the lungs, the brain, the heart, different parts, which now they form the, the cysts. And that is where now the disease uh, comes in, in humans. So the different sites that uh, this, this cyst can end up forming, this hydrated cyst can end up forming, mostly it's in the liver and the lungs. So the liver constitutes almost 65% of the site that uh, the hydrated cyst normally go to, and then we have the liver at around 25 the others include things like the brain, the heart, the kidneys, other parts. So hydrogen cysts normally grows very slowly, gradually. It takes a few centimeters just to grow a few centimeters in a year. So it takes time. So, but however, that growth or that enlargement is the one that brings most of the problem. Typically, if the infection is not too much, we have like a light infestation, then it is normally asymptomatic. It will go unnoticed. However, if cysts now become so much or they grow too big, um, more than five centimeters, now they start uh, uh, putting up pressure on the surrounding parts of the organism, that, uh, the organ that it actually infested in. So you can have different signs and symptoms depending on where, which part of the body is actually having the cyst. In the brain, you'll have different signs and symptoms, in the kidneys, in the liver. But so commonly, like GI problems will be there, like abdominal pain, vomiting, dyspepsia. These, these are obviously there because the adult worm is typically found um, in, in the intestines. So sometimes the cysts can result into some sort of bacterial infection. You, you have a pathogenic liver abscess. And if it ruptures because of the elements that are inside the cyst, you can end up having an aphylactic reaction. So sometimes this become too big. You have a complication where they are like the, if it's in the liver, the, the cyst become too big until they can be pul palpable. And you can see um, in this patient, this size of cyst was actually removed. Okay, so you can have hepatomegaly. Other parts of the body can also become enlarged as well. So diagnosis of this is uh, normally straightforward. Imaging would really paint a good picture obviously after receiving the clinical manifestation. 
Um, so ultrasound MRI scans will be able to show um the will be able to show actually the sort of uh, kind of enlargement that we are having of the cyst. Blood test eosinophilia obviously um, will have elevated eosinophil levels because of this helminthic infection. And ELISA test will be able to show us the immunoglobulin, especially immunoglobulin um, G and E being also uh, present. So the treatment for this being a helminthic infection is obviously uh, mostly, most of the time it will be a combination so of medical and surgical intervention. So medical will involve use of um, anti-helminthic agents like albendazole. So this is normally used to try to restrict uh, progressive growth of the cysts and reduce its size. Um, also, there is a pair technique that basically includes um, puncturing. So if this is with the cyst, they puncture and then aspirate, and then they put in alcohol and then um, re-aspirate again and then close. So this is uh, done as well. However, there's uh, most of the time, if it is an enlarged cyst, then they will have to do um, endocystectomy, basically, which is the removal of the cyst. Like in this case, uh, the cyst in the liver, it is totally removed. That part is totally removed. So for prevention and control, basically we have seen the kind of relationship between dogs, cattle and the human host. So first of all, trying to eradicate stray dogs that are just wandering because those dogs are actually um, the um, definitive host. So they will actually propagate the cycle. Deworming them if you have to have them around. So using of present quantity is a very uh, commonly used uh, uh, procedure for done every around six weeks. Uh, if possible, but if not possible, at least as often as possible to uh, have praziquantel deworming. Then health education, especially on the dangers of very close contact, because the and and the aspect of the dog leaking the either the the, the human or using like the utensils that the humans use, they actually can actually pass on the <clears throat> the eggs because. The, the same tongue that is used to leak you or the or the plates or other things around like the same tongue that is used to clean its behind okay so also infected meat should not be fed to dogs so that now uh, we are not having pass we are not passing on the eggs uh, uh, to them to the dogs as well so thank you very much